good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today for a conversation with uh, John Faraci, the executive chairman of Carrier Corporation and uh, former CEO of International Paper from 2003 to 2014. John has been a, a leader through crises as before. So he was a CFO of International Paper during the 9-11 crisis and its CEO during the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, so currently, he's also the director of uh, ConocoPhillips, uh, PPG, uh, United States Steels Corporation. And he was a, a director of United Technology Corporation uh, prior to its separation. So Carrier Global Corporation, is uh, one of the three entities that made up um, United Technology. And John is its first uh, executive chairman. Uh, they were just listed, I think, last month on the, on the stock exchange. So in addition to his uh, extensive experience in the private sector, John also serves on the board of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And he was the past chairman of the board of Denison University. So last but not least, uh, John is a, a real friend of uh, Columbia Business School, so he serves as an executive in residence, uh, advising uh, MBA students on their career, and he's um, been a frequent uh, guest lecturer in the Economics of Strategic Behavior course, which is a popular elective at the school. Um, moderator today is uh, Stephanie Moroni, who is a second year MBA student at Columbia Business School, so graduating very soon. Um, all that said, let me give the floor to uh, Stephanie, and I'm looking very much forward to uh, hear from John. And thank you so much, John, for, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Professor. And again, thank you so much to John for being here today. We're really lucky to have this opportunity. So we're going to spend the first 45 minutes or so going through the questions that we've prepared, mm -hmm. and then we'll open it up to the audience. So please post your questions in the Q&A box and feel free to start doing so as we're talking. And with that, I think it would be great if John, we could start off with you just briefly walking us through your background and experiences. Okay, I'm gonna do that uh, very briefly, Stephanie. And Wilder, thanks for the introduction. And Stephanie, thanks uh, for you for do, being willing to be the interviewer. I think this is gonna be uh, hopefully interesting and fun. Uh, well, just very quickly, uh, I've uh, been married 40 years. Uh, this year, uh, two daughters, uh, both married, uh, two grandchildren. Uh, my business life was with one organization for 40 years. Uh, I had 21 different assignments. Uh, my last position was a CEO of uh, International Paper, which is a $25 billion global packaging and forest products company. Uh, I was in that position for 11 years. Uh, so basically, if you take out that position, I had 20 assignments over 29 years, and you say I couldn't hold a job. Uh, until I got my uh, until I got my last one, my career was more or less, in my my view, kind of like a jungle gym of experiences. Uh, I had uh, finance jobs, sales jobs, marketing jobs, forestry jobs. Although I was a history major, uh, project management experience, general management, strategic planning, manufacturing, joint ventures, and, and a lot of M and A experience as well. One of the big reasons I stayed at International Paper so long is I kept getting opportunities to learn, develop, and grow. It really turned into I had opportunities to do different things, but the opportunities at IP kept on kept on coming. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes along the way, for sure. Uh, and what I learned from those is uh, you learn your most valuable lessons from the things you try that don't work out, um, uh, and those failures make you a, a better person and a better leader. Um, you know, after IP, I decided to uh, really my priority was not being busy, but being interested. So uh, I said about doing things that I wanted to be interested in, one of which was teaching. And uh, I got uh, into that uh, by being becoming an executive in residence at Columbia Business School. Uh, and I do some, uh, some lecturing and teaching with Ryder and his class on some of his colleagues. Uh, the, uh, I also teach a leadership course at Williams College in January. And earlier this month, I was planning on going out to Kansas State University to do some lecturing on uh, business and leadership, uh, but that's gotten postponed like a lot of other things have because uh, the uh, most campuses like Columbia, our uh, students aren't on campus. Uh, one of my passions uh, is mountaineering and mountain climbing. Uh, I've done that for decades. Uh, the last four years from May to September, I worked for the National Park Service uh, as a backcountry mountaineering ranger in Grand Teton National Park. 
And I have four res three responsibilities. Uh, keep people from getting in trouble or getting hurt, help people who are in trouble, and keep myself out of trouble. So uh, Wider talked about some of the other activities I have, but uh, really, uh, I think I'm 70% interested and 150% interested, 70% busy and 150% interested. So we'll just stop right there, Stephanie. If anybody has any more questions about you know, what I did or why I did it, um, you can take, a, take that up in Q&A. Great, thank you, John. And so as executive chairman of Carrier, can you talk a bit about how COVID-19 is impacting you and your business now? Sure, uh, and I think we really need to kind of start with that, you know, kind of talking about it at the 50,000 foot level, which is society, because it's all about people. And you know, our business is all about people, our customers and our employees. You know, the first thing I'd say, and I guess a lot of us know, we've just got to remind ourselves, this is the first pandemic we've had in 100 years. And in early March, I think in the uh, five major U.S. cities, there were only 23 confirmed cases. So all this happened very, very quickly. Uh, we've now got you know, 2.6 million people in 177 countries. So this is truly global. And Carrier is a global company. Uh, almost half of our business is outside uh, the United States. And it's a real kind of human tragedy that this happened all in such a compressed period of time. Usually things like this kind of unfold over time. And you know, as a result uh, of trying to contain the, the, uh, the virus, mitigate it, um, they call it flatten the curve, we put ourselves in this, uh, I call self-induced economic coma, which basically translated into you know, shelter in place and all non-essential businesses are closed. Uh, Carrier was uh, was deemed an essential business since we're in the uh, fire security uh, and air conditioning and heating business. Uh, people need those products, so our factories are still running, uh, but they've been running up and down because of uh, the uh, we've had to clean them when we've had an incident. And uh, with demand across the United States falling in almost every sector outside, uh, maybe uh, grocery stores and Netflix. Uh, we, we've had to adjust our factory schedules to uh, uh, to adjust to the uh, demand equation, which is a lot lower. We'll probably be off 30% in the month of April uh, from where we would expect to be. And the same thing is true with companies like uh, like PPG, which is an industrial coatings company. I'm on the board there. We expect our April sales to be down 30%. Uh, U.S. Steel the same way. Uh, ConocoPhillips. Uh, which is uh, the biggest oil and gas uh, oil and gas uh, exploration company in the world. Um, we've shut uh, in almost uh, thirty percent of the global oil capacity, all of it in the United States, because uh, uh, the demand in oil has dropped by uh, thirty million barrels a day, or about thirty uh, percent. So, big significant impact. But we're, our focus is on keeping our employees safe, uh, protecting our assets, and most importantly. Uh, communicate with their employees or how we're going to get through this and come out the other end a stronger, better company. Great. Thank you. So we know you have significant experience as a leader in times of crisis. You were CFO of International Paper during 9-11, CEO during 08-09, and are now executive chairman of Carrier. Uh, so 9-11, the financial crisis, and COVID-19 all present very different types of crisis. From your perspective, how is the current situation different from these others? Well, leadership uh, is, from my perspective, is very situational. And, you know, 9-11 was, uh, I remember I, our offices at that point in time were in Connecticut. And I could see the World Trade Centers from, uh, from our office because we were right on Long Island Sound. Uh, and, you know, that was not an economic crisis. It was, you know, kind of an attack by, uh, on our country by a group. You know, the business impact was very localized in New York City. You know, the, basically the city uh, you know, shut down uh, as did Washington, D.C. But our country suffered and was horrified by you know, what they saw, you know, airplanes flying into buildings and uh, buildings collapsing with, with people inside. And so the, I think the business response was true compassion for those who suffered, uh, you know, recognition for those who responded. Uh, in a lot of ways, companies did that. Uh, and visibility for those that you lead. So it's a very different type of leadership response uh, in, that, in that situation uh, than what unfolded in the 0809 crisis, which took a while to totally unfold. 
and then what's happened in uh, COVID-19 where it didn't take very long for things to not just unfold, but to explode. So, you know, in 08, 09, uh, it wasn't a self-induced economic crisis. It started off with, uh, with a bank in the banks and uh, quickly moved into the housing market. That bubble popped and the, our sales at international paper fell about 15 to 20% very, very quickly, but then stayed there uh, and only gradually recovered. So if the leadership challenge there was to be a realistic optimist with your employees, tell them what reality is, uh, but be optimistic about how we're gonna navigate from where we are to where we wanna be, which was economic recovery. Uh, empower people to uh, do what they can to help uh, listen a lot, listen to what employees, listen to their ideas, be decisive, um, deal with ambiguity. There was a lot of uncertainty as to what's next. Um, you know, we had some of our larger competitors going bankrupt, so everybody assumed since we were the largest competitor in the space, um, we were next and we weren't. Uh, you know, We wanted to play to win, so we, we were fortunate. We had a strong balance sheet at the time. We actually went out and made a $7 billion acquisition the day Bear Stearns fell apart, uh, closed on it, or announced it actually. And we did that because we saw this merger as an opportunity to actually strengthen the company uh, to get through the economic downturn that we didn't know how bad it was going to be for how long, but come out the other end, um, you know, uh, a more competitive uh, and better company, which we did. So uh, we, uh, the COVID-19 crisis is, was, also, was very different. It wasn't an, econo an economic crisis that started something. It was a health crisis. So it was a, a virus that none of us had seen before. Like I said, first pandemic in 100 years. But some of the same uh, you know, leadership uh, traits, I think, and competencies are uh, required to help organizations and people get through this. You're dealing with ambiguity. Uh, you've got to be concerned about employee safety because uh, that comes first. Uh, you've got to adjust your business to the demand levels. In some cases, you know, if you're the airline industry, you're down 95%. Uh, if you're a, rest, a small business owner or a restaurant, you have no revenues. Uh, so you've got to deal with supply chain issues, and importantly, uh, you know, all of us are just looking at our liquidity. Um, so I think the the common themes are: be transparent, uh, be a realistic optimist, and, you know, bring out the best in your people, uh, over communicate, uh, and be compassionate. Um, a lot of tough decisions have to get made, but you need to do the leaders need to do those, make those decisions with empathy and compassion, listening to their teams. This is a time when teams really come together. Thank you. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And what advice would you give on managing a through crisis? Were there specific lessons that you learned um, in these past experiences that uh, that you could share with us? You never have all the information you'd like, uh, and when you're seeing things you haven't seen before, like you know, none of us had lived, at least in my you know uh, my lifetime had lived through a financial crisis like we had in 2008-9. It was probably the 1930s since we had a a situation like that. And it's been a hundred years since we've had a pandemic, so we've never seen one of those before either. So I think the thing that to realize very quickly is you're going to be dealing with ambiguity uh, and you're not going to have the answer to all the questions you have that you'd like to have. And you don't need those. Um, but what you need to do is uh, you know, get your leadership teams uh, aligned, empower your employees so that they, they know what they can do to help. And I think one of the real lessons I learned out of the 0809 crisis is is that uh, as I traveled, and now we can't travel, but at that point in time, we could travel. I did a lot of traveling, going out and talking to employees, telling them what they could do to help the company not just survive, uh, but win. So we painted a picture of what success looked like uh, coming out the other end of this whenever we get there. And I think that energized and motivated employees to do things they otherwise wouldn't have done because if you're a leader in a large company, uh, you can't be the only person rubbing the boat. You want to have everybody rowing in one direction as hard as they can. And uh, I saw the power of that, um, you know, as we started to come out of this in 2010. Great. And during these times, especially, I think that you're faced with many difficult decisions that need to be made quickly and timely. Could you walk us through your decision-making process? I, I, you're uh, you giving you more credit describing it as the process. Uh, <laughs> Because you're putting this, uh, you know, this stuff together, kind of as the situation unfolds. Uh, you know, international paper, um, you know, had a, we had a strong balance sheet. 
but the financing market for a while was closed to us, uh, and we had some debt coming up, uh, some debt coming up, and we, we were uncertain whether we could refinance it. So we we kind of organized about what's important now. And for the first couple months, uh, liquidity uh, was our concern and access to capital markets. So we were meeting kind of on a every other day basis, you know, talking about liquidity plans and contingency plans. Uh, and the decision-making process for how to uh, get through this was, you know, what's our rank order of things to uh, go attack? You know, whether it's uh, adjusting our facilities so we didn't produce more products than our customers wanted to buy because we were in a more or less a commodity business. So when supply and demand get out of balance, prices fall. There were some very tough decisions there. Uh, we actually had to close one large facility in Virginia. I remember the governor calling me and saying, what can I do to help you? And I said, unless you can buy all of our product, there's no amount of tax uh, you know, tax holidays you can give us because you know, we've got a demand problem. We don't have a cost problem. So the decision-making process for me was really to make sure my leadership team was aligned and engaged about what we as a leadership team needed to be doing uh, to enable others to do the kind of work as we were all around the world, you know, we had over 300 factories uh, and obviously we couldn't be making all the decisions in Memphis, Tennessee for what was going on in Russia, Brazil, and, you know, in Oregon. Uh, so in empowering people and getting them aligned, I think was the, the, probably the, the key framework for figuring out uh, uh, what to do. And, and the situation changed. Uh, what's, what was important in month one wasn't what was important in month six. Right. And you talk a lot about um, motivating people, the employees, the management team. How, how do you do that during a time uh, where, you, like you said, you can't travel um, and, and be with people physically? How are you adapting to that? Well, we're doing a lot of this, <laughs> what we're doing today. Uh, it's really amazing to see how, uh, how innovative people get uh, and creative when they can't get out and do what they're used to, which is face-to-face -face communication. Um, and I think the first thing I did um, when the financial crisis was unfolding was get on an airplane and not come back for a week, just flew around to different parts of international paper talking to people. Uh, you know, we're now doing that with, um, with webinars, with Zoom meetings, um, the, uh, you name it. And uh, people are, using that they need to be over communicated with. And so being transparent, being visible in a different way, being transparent, uh, explaining what you're doing. And, and importantly, in this situation, explaining to people why, why they have to be at work, because all their colleagues may not be. You know, Some are in offices and they're working from home. Some are in factories that are producing products, explaining to people why that is, and also going overboard to make sure that uh, employees are safe coming to work. Um, you know, there, there is high, there's higher anxiety, um, and we're trying to do everything we can to make sure they, well, everything we can to make sure they've got the proper personal protective equipment. If there's an incident in a facility, we close it down immediately, make sure it's clean. Sometimes that takes a couple of days. Uh, people that have symptoms, uh, we ask them to stay at home. They still get paid. So I think we're trying to make tough decisions and balance out here with an idea that employees feel that we're trying to make the right decisions for them as individuals and for the business in the future. Great. And you talk a lot about the need to be flexible, especially in times like this. How do you believe that organizations need to adapt to survive periods of disruption? Well, it's a good question. Usually, uh, the uh, you don't see the disruption coming. So it just uh, all of a sudden it appears, which is what happened with uh, uh, you know, COVID-19, which, uh, and you know, obviously we had, we had some of what we needed for the healthcare system, but a lot of the things we um, uh, didn't have enough of, or they weren't in the right spot around PPE and uh, hospital beds. And so the, we built a, a capability um, to do all that. The healthcare system didn't break. Um, it got stressed and strained, but it, it didn't break. Um, we were able to uh, get people into hospital beds, not run out of PPE, not run out of ventilators, build hospitals where we need them, you know, move boats around. Uh, the, I think the culture you need to have in an organization is, first of all, you know, a play to win mindset. Um, you know, people uh, should have a vision of, you know, 
how do we be the best company whatever space we compete in? And the invest in change management capabilities so that the organization is understands uh, how to succeed when things change. And any company that's been around over 100 years, international papers, one of them, has been adoptable. Uh, they wouldn't be here, still here today. Uh, but the challenges tomorrow aren't the same ones we faced a decade ago or 20 years ago or even five years ago. So uh, I think recognizing and uh, you know, people, people will make mistakes when you're going through disruption, you're trying to change your business model. Uh, but those really are opportunities. And I, we already see a carrier. Uh, I talk to the CEO a couple of times a week. Uh, new opportunities that will arise when we come out of this that um, we thought might be two years, three years down the road, and they're nine months down the road. And so uh, I think you need to be talking to the organization. You always need to be talking to the organization about um, why yesterday's approach may not be appropriate for tomorrow and you know, get the organization to be adoptable and give them permission to try some new things. Because uh, when you're in a situation like this and you know, making choices, uh, not everything's gonna be perfect and it doesn't need to be. Great. And building off that just a little bit, what are some of the positives that you've seen come out of times of distress? Um, well, for one, I think this comes top of mind to me is COVID-19, all these unsung heroes we have out there uh, you know, we know about first responders, but, uh, you know, people, they're manning the pharmacies, stocking shelves, working at checkout counters, you know, driving trucks, uh, you know, getting, uh, reinventing the supply chain so we can get things from restaurants to grocery stores. I mean, they're truly the uh, unsung heroes that we, uh, they rise to the occasion uh, and manifest themselves in all different ways, and especially in, in this situation. It's been the, uh, you know, the medical community. Uh, doctors, nurses, first responders, and then all the other people that have been rearranging uh, their lives and our lives uh, so that we um, can do what we need to do to, uh, you know, mitigate what's going on, uh, flatten the curve, which I think we've done, and then slowly but safely uh, reopen the economy. Right. And given what we've talked about, I think it's it's pretty clear that things are going to change a lot going forward. What do you think are some of the longer term impacts that we'll see from COVID-19? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, you know, there will be a normal. It probably won't be uh, the normal we had uh, before COVID-19. When we have a vaccine, I think that's a big milestone. That vaccine is probably, the medical experts say, you know, 18 to 24 months away, uh, we'll have one. Um, you know, the, uh, whether we develop it first or gets developed somewhere else, we'll see. Uh, and until that vaccine's available, uh, you know, we've got a, a virus that is, you can be asymptomatic and still be contagious. In fact, the medical experts would say you're most contagious when you're asymptomatic, which is kind of a scary thought. Uh, so social distancing and uh, you know, different um, you know, arrangements at restaurants, um, at universities are going to be important. Uh, we'll have therapeutics this fall. Um, the uh, I understand um, that will reduce the severity uh, of this because it be, it be, uh, it's much more uh, severe than regular flu. Uh, that'll help. Uh, so I think we're going to uh, you know, gradually open up the economy, see what works, um, uh, what doesn't work, and make adjustments. Uh, the uh, the opening up isn't going to uh, guarantee that people go back to their old behaviors. So I think it's going to be important for leaders kind of in government, in the medical profession, and in business to explain to people why it's safe to go to a restaurant, why it's safe to travel, why it's, it's safe to go to a park, uh, uh, what things that people were doing before we put these um, these restrictions in, uh, in the form of, in some cases, restrictions, in some cases, in the form of guidelines that have changed people's behavior. Uh, you know, you know, we'll still be flying airplanes. Um, they all won't be parked. Uh, we'll be able to go to our favorite parks, whether they're in your, you know, whether it's a national park or in your in the park in your town with your with your kids. Uh, so those things will return, but they'll be done with a, kind of a, an extra modicum of safety. Uh, the uh, whole area of contact tracing. If someone gets infected, knowing who that person might come in contact with, new technologies will get developed. At, uh, very quickly to enable that to actually happen, not just be talked about. 
Great. Thank you. And and as a CEO or and as a leader of a business, I'm curious how you balance the the different interests and time horizons of all all of your stakeholders, and does that change at all during a time of crisis? Well, sure it does. I mean, the in the instance of um, you know a virus like this, um, if you believe, and I truly believe, our first responsibility as leaders uh, to our employees and their families is to keep our people safe. Uh, and we've got a personal responsibility to be safe, but we have a responsibility to provide people with the training, the environment that uh, that supports that. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, what we need to be doing is is kind of involving people in those decisions uh, and being available, being transparent, and being visible, and being candid about what we see. Uh, so go back to being a realistic optimist. Uh, not having our head in the sand about this is okay. Um, it's not okay, but uh, we can deal with it. Here's how we're dealing with it, and here's what you can do to help us deal with it. It's, it's very important having that open communication, that dialogue at, at all levels, it's not just the senior leader in an organization. It's everybody who's responsible for people. And when people know that the, the organization they, they work for cares about them, uh, they'll go... Um, above and beyond in my experience to do what they can to help the organization be successful because they know it's the organization cares about cares about its people. When they don't believe that, then they get hesitant uh, and wonder what the motivation is, uh, don't act, wait to be told what to do. And that's not a fast moving organization to respond to crises like this um, at the speed you need to. Right, uh, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. and. And going back to kind of your time at International Paper, uh, you led a pretty significant transformation there um, early on in the company. And what steps did you take to assess what was needed? What questions did you ask yourself? And, and how did you manage that transformation? Well, the first question we asked ourselves, Stephanie, it took a while to, to uh, kind of face up to this, was um, we knew what we wanted to be as a company. But we didn't. Hon we hadn't honestly asked ourselves: Are we really that company? We're the largest uh, packaging and forest products company in the world. Um, uh, that has its pluses and minuses. Uh, but we are average at best, and we really hadn't admitted that as to how far away we were from uh, truly being the best. And in our industry, the value chain of the profit pool wasn't that deep. In other words, it was hard to earn cost of capital returns in our industry. So if you weren't the very best, uh, you weren't going to be earning the right to grow because uh, the uh, uh, you weren't returning cost of capital returns in the capital you were investing. So the first step for us was looking in the mirror and seeing not what we wanted to see, but what we actually were. And that told us that incremental change wasn't going to be enough to go from where we were, which was average, to where we needed to be, which was uh, best consistently by far. So we were earning cost of capital returns over time. And we decided a transformational strategy was what was needed. Uh, we didn't have an activist coming in telling us we had to do this. The board of directors wasn't telling us we had to do this. They were saying, you know, you're not going to be the CEO unless you do this tomorrow. It was, and we had a management team that I thought was, was a strong one of people with different points of view. People weren't afraid to speak up. So we did a lot of debating about, okay, uh, we want to change the company transformationally. We've got lots of choices. You know, let's go pick some and then you know play that new hand, that new uh, play it to win. And what we ended up doing was uh, divesting a third of the company, uh, raising eleven billion dollars, and reinvesting that eleven billion dollars into uh, building uh, a more global company in the businesses we kept. And we got out a lot of the businesses that we we're in that were related to our company, but we said those aren't the ones that we, we're going to overinvest in and and win with. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so it was really about choice making. Um, and the it wasn't my choice, it was the management team's choice. So everybody was aligned and owned the decisions. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time going down into the organization saying, here's what we're doing, here's why. And the prize at the end of this is you know, we can be uh, by far the winner in our space. You know, We're not competing with Apple, we're competing with other packaging companies and here's what we're gonna do and here's how we're gonna do it. But we won't get there with just baby steps. We need to take some big, bold steps. Uh, I call them, you know, bet your job, but don't bet the company. 
And as it turned out, it, it worked. Not everything worked. Some of the investments we made were not successful, and uh, we subsequently uh, sold them or got out of them. Uh, but some of the big moves he made worked very, very well, and we uh, not only transformed the company but the industry because of due to consolidation in our North American competitive environment. Right. And what were some of the biggest debates that were happening um, in, amongst the management team, the board uh, during that time? What to sell and what to keep. You know, we ended up. Uh, International Paper was the largest commercial landowner in the United States for for decades. Uh, we owned over 10, 10 million acres of land. It was the DNA of the company because we started off as a forestry company back in the uh, late 1800s. It was the most profitable business we had. Uh, but as it turned out, it was worth far more to other investors than it was to us. And we only were in the forestry business because we needed the, uh, uh, the fiber to make our products. And we also were the biggest recycler in the world um, uh, as well. Uh, so it was the most profitable business we had. It was part of our DNA. It was kind of the culture of the company. You know, we were attached to the environment, proud of our legacy as being a good steward of, uh, of the environment. And that was a pretty tortured decision uh, for me. My, uh, uh, I didn't want to do it, actually, because I joined the company because it was a, uh, uh, my interest in the outdoors and the environment. Uh, uh, but my uh, heart said, don't do it. My head said, do it. And the management team kind of got around that. And that, that unlocked uh, a whole lot of value because we sold it for far more than it was worth to us. It also took one of the crutches away from uh, not really managing some of our underperforming businesses that we kept really well because you know the forestry business is very, very profitable. Uh, but it wasn't going to, you know, holding wasn't going to differentiate us. So that was that was the toughest decision, I think, um, to make. Right. And are there certain lessons that you can take from this experience at International Paper that can be applied to your leadership at Carrier? And I mean, how does the role of executive chairman differ from CEO in yeah. these situations? You got to start with that. It's very different. Um, you know, there are not many executive chair roles in the United States. It's maybe more common in Europe. I'm not the CEO, so I'm not uh, you know, running the company. I'm really there as a uh, a senior member of the board, uh, and as, as an advisor to uh, a mentor to the CEO, uh, who's new, uh, but very capable, uh, going to be a great CEO, and an advisor to his management team. So, uh, you know, my role is helping uh, the CEO and the management team uh, be successful in building a board because we had no board, no no directors nine months ago, and now we have eight. Uh, we had our first board meeting this week. And as Wetter said, we uh, went public on April 3rd, which wasn't the best day in the best day uh, to go public. Uh, but we did. We needed to because uh, UTC was spinning off another company at the same time and also merging simultaneously with another aerospace company. So all those things had to happen in what was not a great time to go to the market as a public company. Uh, so lessons I've learned, uh, the people will respond uh, to... Uh, Leadership, if they believe in it, they believe there's a future for them, and they believe that their leaders care about them. And I, I can't stress that more. That doesn't mean you don't make tough decisions, and sometimes those tough decisions impact people. Sometimes it's fewer jobs. You see what's happening. A lot of companies now, there are you know, furloughs and layoffs. We've got 26 million people that were, most of them were all employed eight weeks ago, and now all of a sudden we have 26 million that were uh, unemployed. Uh, those are hard decisions to make, but you know um, they need to be made. And we're talking about people's lives in this crisis and their livelihoods. And balancing that out and explaining to people why we're doing things is, is critically important. And what happens when you do that well, uh, and you do have a competitive company, uh, you people respond and they see the results, and it's like a flywheel. People say, "Okay, um, you know, we can do this. We can accomplish things we've never done before." Uh, because we're ready, willing, and able to do it. And you know, that just creates a, a momentum that builds success, builds success. Uh, now, there are always mistakes and failures along the way. Those build capacity and capability, but winning builds confidence. Right. You just never want, never want to be complacent. Yes, absolutely. And the, so... The next disrupt, disruption is right around the corner. Yeah. 
Yes, you never know what what's coming. Um, and and so I'm curious, what were some of the biggest challenges that Carrier was facing before the crisis happened, and how has the focus shifted? Well, this is I'll, I'll give you an extreme here. We uh we counted this up. We had 163 ERP systems in Carrier because Carrier is really an amalgamation of a number of acquisitions made over time that were never integrated from an ERP standpoint. So one of our priorities is simplifying the ERP system. That's gone to the bottom of, of the list. That's the last thing we need to do in, in a time like this. Uh, we did spin out with, uh, we're, still, we're an investment grade company, but we, we had zero debt when we were part of UTC. Uh, and now we have $11 billion of debt. Uh, so liquidity is important. Um, and you know we have to see how demand, demand settles down, settles out at 30% off is the worst it is, we'll be okay. If it's sixty percent off, you know we're probably not. So we need to see a couple, a uh, couple quarters of uh, of how things are going to play out before we uh, decide whether the liquidity piece is um, is okay. But you know, Carrier has got a great brand, uh, good market share, uh, but we've taken our eye off organic growth, and we've focused on margins for too long of you know, having the best margins, which we do. Uh, but some of our competitors were their organic growth is better than ours, and so. The, uh, the coming into 2020, you know, we announced the spinoff last June. So we've been working on it for like 10 months. We were all prepared to have a growth plan for 2020. Obviously, there's no growth plan for 2020 because the markets aren't growing. Um, so we're not going to uh, put that in the drawer and forget about it. We're going to put it kind of a, uh, still on the table uh, and we'll be opportunistic. But uh, we kind of shifted our emphasis now to Let's make sure we keep our employees safe, protect our assets, stay close to our customers, uh, get ready to uh, uh, to be in the marketplace with the best products, the best service, the best distribution, uh, and grow as we come out of this. Great, thank you. And I just have one last question before we open it up to the audience and we have some questions coming in, which is great. Uh, speaking both as a CEO and as an executive in residence for Columbia Business School, what advice would you would you share with soon to be graduates or young professionals during this time? Well, yeah, I, I fully recognize for all of us this is kind of a disturbing and anxious time. I mean, you, uh, you know, we're dealing with a virus you can't see, which you don't have a vaccine for. Uh, the it's having a big impact on uh, small businesses for sure large businesses, but small businesses, you, uh, the, you know, some may not open. Uh, so I'd say stay flexible. And then it's the most, the uh, thing, this is a, no one wants to turn a crisis into a, an exciting opportunity. That's, not, uh, but there's a ton that we can all learn uh, from uh, this crisis and how companies and how people respond to it. That um, is a learning experience we, have, we just ought to capture. So, um, I'd say the be willing in whatever company or organization, big or small, you're going to. Uh, if someone says, you know, we'd like you to do this, not what you signed up to do, take advantage of that. Uh, you'll you'll learn, to, you'll be exposed to things that you never would have been exposed to before. As we all navigate through this together, uh, with, regardless of whether you're in the real estate business, finance business, in a startup, a uh, big company, uh, consulting company, you'd be doing things that uh, you wouldn't have been doing if the world hadn't changed and not almost turned us upside down. So stay flexible, uh, be willing to do things that um, you didn't expect to do. Um, I spent my career uh, getting jobs that I never anticipated getting. I, I never got the job I wanted next, I always got something different. Uh, and that turned out to be an incredible learning experience. And so I, I think it'll be that way for uh, all of you who are graduating um, you know, this, this summer as well, um, but be comfortable with it being maybe different. Great, thank you. I think that's absolutely right and very similar to what, what we've been hearing, the importance of flexibility and um, being open-minded a lot about a lot of different opportunities. Um, so we have a, a question here from the, from the audience. Um, curious to hear what mistakes you have made uh, that you learned the most what, from when le leading during the times of crisis. Uh, I think most of my mistakes were made in the time of no crisis, which would say, why did, why did you do that? Um, 
you know, we got into, uh, and I'll just kind of go backwards. Um, you know, while I was CEO, uh, I kind of led us to an investment in India. I thought in India was important to get into India. Uh, we probably got in 10 years too early and uh, bought the wrong company. And so that didn't turn out to be a very successful uh, investment. And, you know, my successor did the right thing. Um, he kind of saw it was too long to wait. And so we, uh, we got out of India. We made, coming out of the transformation plan, uh, when we sold all those assets, we did four things. We invested, we made a big investment in Russia, a big investment in Brazil, and a medium-sized investment in China, and a, and a small one in India. China and India didn't work. And they were on me. Those those were things I drove. Um, the uh, and uh, the Russia and Brazil worked extremely well. In fact, Russia was uh, you know kind of a grand slam home run. Uh, early in my career, I uh, I was running a business. It was the first big general management summit I had, and we were building a plant to make a new product. And this plant cost us a hundred million dollars to build, and it turned out that the plant couldn't make the product. Um, we had not done the, the work going from uh, the pilot trials uh, to uh, the scale-up trials. And when we spent $100 million, we basically had to conclude this factory wasn't going to work. It couldn't produce the product we, we built it for. And I had to go tell the CEO at the time uh, that we'd spend, we were going to spend $100 million and not have a factory. That would, uh, we'd hire all the employees, and we're going to have to shut it down because the product didn't perform in the marketplace. And, I learned some huge lessons about um, questions I didn't ask, uh, processes I didn't put in place where we should have seen that happening very early before we spent $100 million. Um, uh, when I also early in my career, uh, I, uh, I had a sales job, didn't, didn't last very long. I wasn't a very good salesperson. So <laughs> the organization quickly concluded is get this guy into another, another spot. Uh, so, uh, and it wasn't a day I came home from work where I didn't think, hey, I could have handled that situation, uh, that meeting, uh, that employee, that decision a little differently. And uh, one of the things I learned to do, uh, learned to do better, maybe I wasn't good at it, but better was I learned to speak less and listen more, especially as I became CEO, uh, because uh, listening to the team I had really bought out the best in our decision making. Um, I wasn't the smartest person in the room all the time, and maybe none of the time. Thank you. I think those are, are very helpful to hear. What Another question here is, what is your process in messaging to employees who are worried about an uncertain future uh, with potential loss of life and income source? Well, the message is there is, um, you know, there is hope. Um, I think being a realist or optimist, again, you can't, you know, sugarcoat it if someone's lost their job or their spouse has lost their job, or their children have lost their job. Uh, but this, uh, this country and, and you know, people, doesn't matter whether it's the United States or uh, you know, Brazil or, or, uh, or France, uh, people are Brazilian. And uh, I think if you're, uh, if you're a learning person uh, and you're willing to learn new skills, uh, take some chances, uh, you know, work hard, uh, and uh, you can create a future for yourself that's one that, that's a positive one. And to me, the, we used to ask people at International Paper, why do you stay, not why do you join the company? And they stay because they've got opportunities to learn, develop, and grow. Uh, they like the work environment, uh, and they're proud of the company they work for. And if you're willing, if you find that kind of career, uh, which I would encourage all of you to not just go to a job, but go to a place you have some passion about, do something you're passionate about, whether it's a not-for-profit or a for-profit company. Um, you can reinvent yourself, uh, you know, several times during your career. Um, so if there's some setbacks. Um, don't take those setbacks as being permanent. There are opportunities to learn a lot uh, and then get back in the game. Great, thank you. Um, Another question we have that's come in is a few years ago, Carrie was in the news with the announced plan to close an Indiana plant and, and move to Mexico. Right. Um, there, there was an employee iPhone video, the plant manager in Indianapolis announcing the closing and right. the, the angry reaction of the plant employees to all, all of this include. Uh, and so 
curious, how do you think managing and announcing closings and layoffs should have been handled better? Great question. We got a new best friend out of that experience in, um, in Washington, D.C. I was actually at the Carrier Indianapolis facility uh, early in March. Uh, it was the last plant visit I made. Um, it was, I think it was March 9th and March 10th, things started to unfold. Uh, and I will tell you, it's, it's very interesting. The morale at the carrier facility uh, was uh, high and good. I walked around the plant uh, talking to a lot of people, uh, shaking hands, which I admit I probably shouldn't have done, but at that point in time, it wasn't uh, that wasn't taboo. Uh, but people were uh, interested in how the facility was doing. Um, the you know, wanted to ask what they could do to help so we could reinvest in it. Uh, what we should have, what we should have done uh, with communicating that to me, I wasn't deeply involved in it. You know, I was on the board of United Technologies. Uh, it was, it was, we knew the decision was being made, uh, but you know, didn't get involved in how it was done. I think it, uh, we probably didn't let employees know that how that plant was doing competitively compared to the other facilities that we had uh, in Mexico uh, and one in, in Tennessee. This was a big. Uh, one, a large facility that made uh, residential air conditioning. And you, when you make decisions like that, employees need to understand the context ahead of time. You just can't drop something on somebody and they have no context to how this is made. And the carrier facility was not a competitive facility um, in the scheme of United Tech, uh, of carriers, uh, other options. So uh, the, and it wasn't clear how we could invest uh, to make it fully competitive. So we ended up um, not closing at all, but more or less right-sizing it to uh, uh, what it needed to be given its competitive position, Ch changing some of the product portfolio, moving some products in, some products out, uh, and, and telling the employees, the employees look, you, you can create your own future here uh, if you put your efforts into making this plant more competitive and the management team is there to help you do that. I mean, we, we're going to support you on this. And so in a period of four years, we've gone from having, you know, uh, uh, poor morale, uh, not a good working relationship with the factory floor and leadership to having, I, I met the, the uh, new plant manager we bought in uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Indianapolis. And they're probably uh, close to a thousand people who work there and she's, she's just the kind of person we need. She connects with people. She's honest. She's transparent. Uh, she gets results. She celebrates, rec she recognizes uh, success, uh, recognizes people for contributing to that success. And uh, the, uh, so we had a situation that was difficult and I think we've repaired it. Um, we just got to keep it going. And, and the facility needs, needs to stay competitive. This is at the end of the day, this is all about uh, being competitive with, costs and products to uh, uh, to be able to invest in these facilities because companies have choices and they should make those choices. But I don't think we educated the employees um, and prepared them for that this was a possibility. Um, and sometimes you um, you think you've done that, but you actually haven't. Great. Um, another great learning experience. And we have one last question that's come in through the Q&A chat. If anyone else has any other questions, please uh, feel free to post them there. Um, this question uh, comes from a, a student. Do you, do you recommend to handle crises and future matters with parallel teams or with the same leadership team? The, say that question again, Stephanie. I'm not sure I caught it there. Sure. Do you, do you recommend recommend handling crises uh, and in future situations with parallel teams or with the same leadership team? Oh, well, I think it, it's a function of you know how what that crisis affects. Uh, the you know some things should be handled locally because they are local, and the leadership team at the local level, let's say it's a factory in Czechoslovakia, uh, that's uh, you know, the managed team on the ground there uh, knows the issues, um, has got the responsibility and the capability to kind of manage the uh, the issue, whatever it is, um, you know, a fire, a fatality, uh, a product issue. Uh, if it's something that affects the company around the world, it's obviously the, the senior leadership team's got to set the stage and the context for that so they can give guidance to the people 
around the world is how to handle it. So I think it, it depends upon the location, the level, and the severity. Um, you know, with something like this, uh, the COVID crisis, where again we were at full employment at the uh, beginning of February in the country, and all of a sudden we go from full employment to probably. 15 to 20 percent unemployment. We haven't seen the numbers yet, but they're going to be big. Uh, you know, that's something that we need to respond to company wide uh, and be communicated company wide uh, and globally, not just uh, not just regionally. Uh, so I think it's really a function of uh, uh, what the crisis is, and then you know how how you've seen yourself respond to it in the past. Uh, we were uh, maybe uh, I think we. As the country were probably a little slow on testing. Everybody would recognize that. So, the, you know, the medical community for sure is going to go back and do a reevaluation of, you know, why is it taking us so long to get the proper testing regimes in place uh, and uh, try to be better prepared for the next crisis we have. It's because this probably won't be the last pandemic. Hopefully, it's the last one we have in all of our lifetimes, but there's another one out there that's going to come. Great, thank you. And I think that's all of the questions that we have coming in from the audience. So I think we'll end there. I wanna say thank you again, John. This has been a fantastic learning opportunity for all of us and uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, thank you to our audience as well and for all of your great questions. Um, so I think we'll end there and be well everyone and, and take care. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for being the moderator and thank all of you for listening in. And uh, I'll just say one thing to, to end it. Uh, I'm confident that all of you will end up with uh, you know, maybe a, a different career path than you might have thought, different timing, uh, different place. But uh, the, uh, you know, the economy and the country and the world is going to emerge from this. And uh, you know, think of what we were doing uh, before the crisis hit. When the crisis is over, uh, there'll be opportunities. Uh, the, uh, for all of you and uh, good luck, good luck in the future. Thank you.